Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for your presence here this morning. 909, I thank you that, God, you wake up so much earlier than we do. You've already had your coffee, Lord. I'm just, I'm kidding. That's, that's not biblical. Um, but who knows? He could do whatever he wants. He's God, even if he doesn't need it. You think he needed rest? He didn't need rest, but he chose to. He can choose to do things he doesn't need to do, you know? He's a little bit bigger than our boxes. That's not what I'm preaching on. Hi, I'm Seth. Good to see you. Happy Resurrection Sunday. Oh, it's so good to see you. It is so good to be with you this morning. I'm honored to be able to have the great privilege of sharing the word with you today on this Resurrection Sunday. And we're going to jump right into it. I don't, I, don't, I don't have like a special little, special little intro for you. We're going to be reading from John chapter 4 this morning. The Gospel of John is John the disciple's account of the life. Not yet. I'll, I'll invite you. I'm going to give a little context first. John the disciple's account of the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. This is John's mission statement for his gospel account that he says in chapter 20, that his primary purpose is this, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. See, I like this from John because I like clarity. He does, a lot of the things that John says are very kind of mysterious, and I would use the term swirly twirly, although that's not from the Bible, it's from a movie. Um, but I love how clear his mission statement is. He's, he's not beating around the bush. He says, I didn't write this so you could know about a good teacher. I didn't, I didn't write this so you could have a good example. I didn't write this so you could have your best life now. I wrote this that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. Christ is the Greek form of Messiah, the chosen one, the anointed, the King of Israel, the Son of God, that by believing you may have life in his name. That's a clear mission. In chapter four, we find Jesus traveling with his disciples from Judea to Galilee. Now it says in the text that he had to pass through Samaria. He had to, which I, I, I would argue is a bit of a loaded statement because at this time, Jews typically avoided passing through Samaria. You see, they had a bit of a turbulent relationship the Jews and the Samaritans that went back hundreds of years. And I don't have time to go too far into the history, but I can tell you this. They did not associate with one another. But for some reason, Jesus had to pass through Samaria. Now, as he was traveling, he came to a well. And it wasn't just any well. This was known as Jacob's well. And it was a location rich with Jewish history. And, and Jesus would have known about this location. Now, he sat by this well in the heat of the day, the sixth hour, it says. And he was alone. His disciples had gone into town. But he was not alone for long. We're going to pick up the story in verse 7. Now, will you stand with me for the reading of the word? For those of you who are new to our culture, I invite you to stand for the reading of the word because it is distinct. It is perfect. It is living, it is active, it is sharper than any two-edged sword, and we honor these words higher than any other words I share today. Amen. Starting in verse seven. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me? a woman of Samaria, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, <laughs> you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? <laughs> I love that question. He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. 
The water that I will give him will come, will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. And Jesus said to her, go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband. For you have had five husbands and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. This is God's word. You may be seated. It's not lost on me that on Resurrection Sunday, also known as Easter Sunday, that not everyone here today usually participates in church. And I just want to say to all of you, if, if that's you, I'm so glad you came. You are welcome here. Now, whether church is a regular part of your life or it's more of a loosely held tradition than you engage in at times, or this is the very first time you've experienced something like this, which actually might be the case if you have been in church, but. <laughs> the truth is that each one of us came here today with a story. And that's not a profound thing to say. Of course, each one of us has a story. We're human beings. And no one gets this far without experiences and situations that shape us and impact who we are becoming. Now, every one of us in the room can look back at parts of our story and identify challenges, hurts, and maybe even trauma. Still bearing the scars to prove it. With that being said, all stories are not created equal. For some of us, these painful experiences haven't been just parts. They've been the main plot line. For some people in the room today, that's true. You see, the woman that met Jesus that day at the well, the woman from Samaria, she had her own story, and maybe it's one you're familiar with. But as familiar as you might feel with the Samaritan woman at the well, there is a lot that we do not know about her. What we do know is that she was a Samaritan, which meant something. She came to the well alone. And she came at a very odd hour of the day. She had five husbands, or she had had five husbands. And the man that she now had was not her husband. You know, through the years, scholars have tried to better understand what these elements about the Samaritan woman, what they mean. And we'll talk about some of those scholars' conclusions. But for now, I would ask you to keep the woman at the well in mind as we are invited into part of another story. Right. What is right? Cause 
We just saw a woman dealing with trauma from her childhood, trying to live her life for God, but caught up in addiction. I want to read to you some of these lyrics that we just heard in case you didn't catch them. Some call it a habit. Some call it a sin. Some call it a pattern. I don't know where this ends. They call me a daughter, but I don't believe them. Baptized in the water, don't feel any different. All I know, it's a sign. So I lift up my hands, worshiping Jesus, but I'm drunk again. I wonder how, how many of us can find ourselves in that story. Now, you might be saying, well, Seth, I haven't struggled with alcohol, so I can't see myself that way. There are many ways that we try to numb our hurts from the past. Maybe it isn't alcohol for you. Maybe it's sexual addiction. Maybe it's the love of money. Maybe it's a compulsive relationship with your phone. AKA your pacifier. There are many anesthetics for the soul. Many ways that we try to forget pain and they look different for each one of us. I wanna call your attention back to the woman at the well. There are a few approaches that theologians and scholars have taken to interpreting the situation that the woman found herself in when she encountered Jesus. One approach, and I would say probably the most popular approach, is to see this woman as a flagrant and habitual sinner. Let's look at the fact that she came to the well at such a strange hour, the sixth hour of the day, the heat of the day, an odd time, not normal. Or how about that she came alone when in this cultural moment, it was very odd for a woman to be unaccompanied and traveling to a well. Perhaps these two elements suggest that she was trying to avoid other people 
because just maybe she was a social outcast, maybe because of her own behavior. Then we have the topic, the uncomfortable topic of her five husbands and the man that she now has that is not her husband. Is she a serial adulterer? Was she running around on those husbands? Maybe even a prostitute? At the very least, she must be living in sin. This approach to the passage has gained a lot of traction over the years. But it's actually not the only viable interpretation. I want to tell you about a different way that this passage can be read as well. But first, we're going to see part of another story. One person is dead after this crash. One other person was taken to the hospital with non-life-threatening injuries. You have no idea the kind of day that I just had. I have no idea. Seriously? You wake up, you drink, you drink when you get home. You have no idea what it's like to Why be. Why don't you just back off? Go! Every time I walk out of the house But on another face Just to blend in with the crowd So nobody sees me You will never believe me I tell you that I'm whole But I'm still healing I tell you that I'm happy But I'm grieving Thought I was a fighter I'm still in the fight But if I'm being Tell you that I'm whole, but I'm still healing. I tell you that I'm happy, but I'm grieving. Thought I was a fighter. I'm still in the fire. We just saw a man grieving the loss of a loved one, trying to keep up appearances to convince everyone, including himself, 
that he's okay. This one might hit a little close to home for a lot of people in the house today. You may not have recognized it, that that was actually my voice singing that version of that song. And I almost didn't agree to it because I recognized I was going to be preaching and that we were also going to be having me sing a song in the middle of the sermon. The only reason I share that with you is that part of the reason I said yes to our creative team is that those words mean something to me. I know what it's like to feel the pressure of making everyone, a thousand people on a Saturday and a Sunday, think that everything's okay. Now that story isn't my story. That story is not even the actor's story. And maybe it's not yours, but can you find your story in that one? Whether it's the loss of a loved one or some other hidden pain beneath the surface, many of us walking, are walking around every day trying to convince everyone that we're fine. You ever noticed how culturally, when you ask someone how they're doing, they kind of just have to say, I'm good. And if they answer any other way, it's like, whoa, I, I, that's not what I meant. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't actually, I wasn't actually asking how you were doing. I was just greeting you. Please forgive me for asking that question. You might notice if you talk to me and you greet me, I rarely will ever say that because I try to never ask that question unless I'm ready to hear the answer. You'll notice me usually saying it's good to see you because it is good to see you. And if I have time in that moment and virtue in that moment to hear how you're really doing, I'll ask you. In light of this kind of experience, I want to tell you about the other primary way that the story of the woman at the well is interpreted. Some of you may have noticed, some scholars have noticed that there is no mention of the word sin in this passage, no mention of a need for forgiveness or a call to repentance, nothing like that. We might've expected to see something like that in this text if this woman was truly as reprehensible as many have interpreted her to be. See, it was not completely uncommon for women to marry more than once in their lifetime in this cultural context. So easy to read the Bible through our own cultural lens and say, I'm just reading it straight. Give me a break. Give me a break. What you mean is I'm reading it through the lens of the United States of America in 2024, and I'm calling it straight because I'm that culturally egocentric. Happy Easter. Many women were married for the first time as a young teenager. Not like what makes us feel comfy, like 19. My wife was 19 when we got married. She was able to make that decision for herself. I'm talking about young teenagers. And often to much older men. I'm only three years older than her, by the way. (laughs) The gap felt pretty big at the moment. I'm going to leave that there. (laughs) But in this culture, the gap often was actually very big. Very young women with a lot older men. And it wasn't abnormal for the woman to outlive her first husband and maybe even her second. And if a woman's husband died, she would usually need to get remarried in order to maintain access to legal, economic, and social connections. I know that might sound foreign to you, Maybe that should open your eyes to the fact that this text is written for you, but not to you. Even in cases of divorce, men were usually the ones who held the majority of the power and the leverage to divorce. And men would often divorce their wives simply because they were not pleased with them. A certificate of divorce because of hardness of heart. And once again, 
If a man divorced a woman, remarriage may have been her only viable path to financial and, sto- and social stability. What about, what about the man she currently had? It was not her husband. How are you going to weasel your way out of that one, Seth? I'm not trying to weasel out of anything. I'm presenting two different interpretations, but I hear, I hear some of your thoughts. I'm not terribly concerned with them, but... <laughs> Marriage laws were different back then. Certain people were not allowed to get married at all because of their status. And others were restricted to only marry certain people of the same class or status. In these cases, some couples would opt for something akin to what we would know maybe as common law marriage. Perhaps even seeking to be married before God, even though the state refused to recognize their marriage as legal. What about what she has to say with regard to God and faith? In verse 12, we saw that she has at least some knowledge of her spiritual heritage and that she identifies to some great degree with that spiritual heritage, even though she would have been viewed by the Jews as something along the lines of mixed blood. She still identified with Jacob. Then directly following the passage that we started with in verses 19 through 30, we read that she recognizes Jesus as a prophet and then immediately begins to talk about worship specifically about the contrast between Samaritan and Jewish worship and their traditional places of worship. If you're familiar, you know what I'm talking about. See, Jesus shifts her paradigm. He explains to her this beautiful truth that we now get to enjoy, that the time was coming and now had come. I love that Jesus said both. When worship is not about a sacred location, I'm going to say that again for everyone sitting in the, in the church seats today. Worship is not about a sacred location, but about spirit and truth. She responds by affirming her belief about the coming Messiah. And Jesus tells her that he is that Messiah. Now, she she then goes into town, it says, and tells the people, come see a man who told me all I ever did. I mean, he didn't technically say all you ever did, but it made enough of an impact on her. And who knows what Jesus said that John left out. And they listened to her. Selah. They listened to her and they came to meet Jesus. It seems that this woman had at least some credibility with her surrounding community. Is this a story of a woman given over to her sinful desires, ostracized due to her own poor behavior? Or is it a story of a God-fearing woman, either widowed or abandoned or a combination of the two, carrying the scars of suffering that was beyond her control? The truth is, we don't know. And maybe that's how it's supposed to be. Maybe that's not the point of the story of the woman at the well. Maybe there's just enough mystery left here for each of us to see our stories reflected in hers. And maybe this story actually has more to say about who Jesus is and about what he does than about specific details regarding the woman at the well's personal life. Let's return one more time to the stories of the man and the woman into which we have been given a glimpse today. How's your problem? What's my problem? Yeah. Ah, uh, good, good, yeah. Definitely grab a drink, because that's what you need. You have no idea the kind of days that I just had. I have no idea. You're just like you drink that, you drink. You have no idea what it's like. Why don't you just back off? Our- the moment when I you say my name It's the first time in so long I'm not afraid I'm not afraid 
And you are the voice that calms the storm inside me Castle walls that stand around me All this time my guardian was good And you are the light that shines in every tunnel There in the past you'll be there tomorrow All my life your love was breaking through one person it's is dead been after this crash. And it's always been you. My northern star. Your love will be the compass of my heart. Oh, I just want to be right where you are. storm inside me, castle walls that stand around me, all this time my guardian was me, and you are the light that shines in every tunnel, there in the past you'll be there tomorrow, all my life your love was breaking through, it's always been here. Jesus was there. Your darkest moment. You felt totally alone. When you had no hope. He was there and he cared about what you were going through. And he loved you there. At your lowest. His love was just as great for you as it ever will be. And you know, he's no stranger to pain. He knows suffering very well. See, today we celebrate his resurrection and a beautiful celebration it is. And he is risen. <laughs> Amen. But for a resurrection to take place, a death must precede it. Jesus experienced the worst pain imaginable. His flesh torn apart by whips, his head gouged by thorns, his hands and feet pierced with nails, his body hung on a cross in such a way to cause slow, agonizing suffocation. And then finally, death. And all this, he was perfectly innocent. And do you know why he would endure such a thing? For you, for the joy set before him. And you were the joy. He suffered and died on your behalf so that you could be made right with God and live forever with him. Seth, why do I need to be made right with God? Because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We were dead and our trespasses and through Christ, we have been made alive. It is only in faith in him, which we can truly live. Don't make the mistake of thinking that Jesus doesn't understand your suffering. 
or that he's afraid of it or that he's ashamed to talk about it. For some of you, a lot of your suffering is from the past and you've made decisions in light of that suffering that you now regret. For others of you, you are right in the middle of it, right now, in a dry and desolate land, seeking just a little relief from overwhelming pain. Maybe you're here and you don't even know you're broken. You're so numb that you don't even know there's a problem. I have to tell you, I'm gonna be real with you right now. That's the most dangerous place you could be. But it is good you're here. Whichever condition you showed up in today, Jesus, for some reason, he had to pass through Coeur d'Alene. For some reason, he had to pass through heart of the city. For some reason, as wild and as maybe from your perspective, strange as we might be, he had to pass through to meet with you. And I believe that he comes to you today and just like he spoke to the woman at the well over 2,000 years ago, he says, ask me and I will give you living water. A water that will never leave you thirsty. A water that will become a spring within you, welling up to eternal life. Many of us have drank from many wells, from many springs. We've tasted the wells of this earth. How did that go for you? How did it go for you? When you thought someone of the opposite sex could fix you? How did it go for you when you felt like a substance would allow you to continue on? How did it go for you when you thought a certain income level would bring you contentment? How did it go for you when you thought, when I'm truly secure and safe, then I'll be happy? All those wells, they do not satisfy. And if you have drank from them, you know that they do not satisfy. There is only one water that truly satisfies and that wells up within us into a spring of eternal life. And there's only one who offers that kind of water and his name is Jesus. And I wonder what your response to him will be today. Will it be a reasonable response? Will it be an adequate response? Will it be a response that makes any sense at all? Regardless of how you came today, regardless of how people have interpreted you or judged you, Jesus came to meet with you and he's inviting you to drink of the living water. Will you say yes? I wanna ask you to bow your heads with me in this moment. Close your eyes. This is what I want to offer. I wanna offer the chance to make a commitment to Jesus as the King and the Lord of your life. The Bible says, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God rose him from the dead and you will be saved. I wanna invite you into this commitment today. If you came here and you know that you have not given your life to Jesus wholeheartedly or that you did at one point, but you have since withheld that trust and rejected him, I wanna invite you to make a real commitment with your words and your heart. 
It can't just be vain repetition. I'm going to lead you in the prayer, but vain repetition has no power in it. What has power in it is the gospel of Jesus Christ and your reception and belief and faith in the gospel of Jesus. I wanna invite you to pray this prayer with me from your heart in church. I wanna invite you to pray with us as well, like this. Father, I know that I've sinned and that my sin separated me from you and that I was dead in my sin. But I thank you that you made a way for us to be close again. You sent your son, Jesus the Messiah, to die on my behalf and reconcile me to you. And it is in his name that now I have access to eternal life. Today I turn away from my sin and I turn toward you and I put all my hope and all my trust in the name of Jesus alone. Amen. If you made that commitment today, either for the first time or you know that today you're coming home to Jesus after rejecting him, we want to celebrate you and we want to walk with you as a family of faith. And so I want to invite you to do something very bold as we recognize you and celebrate with you this morning. Would you raise your hand right now? I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. Anybody? Come on. Come on. I see that hand. I see that hand. Come on. Today's your day. I see that hand. Woo! Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Today is the day of salvation, and there is rejoicing among the angels of heaven. If you made that decision, that commitment today, whether you raised your hand or not, please do not leave today without going and seeing my friends, the Van Lings under the cross. They wanna give you a Bible and they wanna to talk to you about next steps. Cause you just made a commitment on your own volition by yourself, but a life with Jesus is done in community and in a family.